As promised, here are Brett Okamoto and Megan Anderson. Brett, you and I have been talking about the sport for some time. Lightweight isn't one of these divisions like you have GSP at welterweight or John Jones at light heavyweight. A lot of guys who are impressive but somewhat even ground, where do you place Mahachev today in terms of the pantheon of lightweight greats? Man, listening to, uh, to that resume that you just rattled off, Phil, it's hard not to put him right at number one. I think he's, he and Habib Nurmagomedov are right there, neck and neck, as the greatest lightweight of all time already. Uh, BJ Penn had set the standard for so long, and I think that's just because he was one of those guys who came first. But you look at what these guys have done from Dagestan, just the, the level of domination that both of them had. I would still put Habib just slightly above. Maybe that's just the aura of Habib. Maybe that is because he did come before Islam. But Islam's right there, man. Islam is right there. One more title defense, two more title defenses. Give us to the end of the year. This guy could already be walking around as the greatest lightweight of all time. I mean, I have to 100% agree with Brett. And much to his point, the aura of Habib, and I think a lot of that comes with the fact that he was undefeated. Uh, he very rarely lost a round in the entire time that he was in the UFC. And much to Brett's point, you give Islam another couple title defences, he clears out the division, he goes up and say he, he takes on Leon Edwards or whoever is the welterweight champ, and he beats him, he becomes the next champ champ. I think only then will we see him surpass... Habib in terms of greatest lightweight of all time in UFC history. Yeah, I mean, Habib, you go back to what, Glayson Tebow was the only time he was, you could really make a case that somebody should have maybe outpointed him, maybe. Uh, th that dominance and that aura is part of it. And we're, we're talking about really small margins when we're the greats of all time. I and mean, we have the Olympics coming up. No one's winning the 100 meters by a second and a half. We're talking about the best in the world. It's going to come down to really small factors. And some of the guys of yesteryear I mentioned, a lot of them were contemporaries and they fought and beat each other. Makhachev and Nurmagomedov were never going to do that. So the fact that they are teammates and now it's coach and protege, it, it kind of adds to the collective legacy. So, Brett, you mentioned it. If he gets a couple more wins, that's really going to fortify Makachev's case. And if he keeps winning, ultimately, he would, I think, in all of our minds, pass Habib. So with that said, you're the MMA insider. Who might be next for Makachev? I don't think you even need to be an MMA insider to know the answer to this one. It's Armand Zarukian. The UFC came out before UFC 300. They made a fight between Zarukian and Charles Oliveira, and they called it a number one contender's fight. They don't always do that because they don't like to handcuff themselves, so to speak, into a decision before a fight happens. But that was the case. And then they went to Armand and asked him if he wanted to fight UFC 302. That was too quick of a turnaround. Nobody can blame him. So I do believe he will be the next number one contender at lightweight. The only thing that could throw a wrench in it, I think, is that if Leon Edwards goes out and beats Bilal Muhammad, and as Megan kind of alluded to, Islam wants to move up. If if Leon starts calling for that fight and says, hey, there's a there's a guy who, who at lightweight thinks that he can beat me, I want him to come on up, that would just create so much fan interest that I think the UFC would take a strong look at it. But if Leon doesn't really press the issue, I think it's going to be business as usual, and Islam's going to take on the next number one contender, and that will be Armand Zarukian. I agree with Rhett wholeheartedly. Armand Zarukian, and very... Much to his point, very rarely do we ever, ever get a true, this is a 100% number one contender fight. And that was what Oliveira and Sarukian was. He won that fight. He should be next in line. Leon Edwards, yes, is a wrench of the work, kind of what Brett alluded to. But I also think another wrench, potentially, is if Connor beats Chandler, I see them with the hype behind Connor and the history between the Irish team and the Dagestani team. I see that fight potentially, you know, jumping the line because we know Connor is very hard to get into the cage to begin with. If he beats Chandler, they'll want to push that a pretty quick turnaround, maybe end of the year, Madison Square Garden, that makes sense potentially. But I think we have some great options for Islam. We've got Sarukian, we've got Leon Edwards in a championship fight, potentially a Conor McGregor if he can get past Chandler. They're all big money fights, in my opinion, for Islam and for the division. And it, it, it historically has been one of the deepest division in the sport. You could take a snapshot at any point in the last 20 years and it, you'd have a good chance it would be the deepest at that point. Sarukian's won nine of the last 10. This isn't always a meritocracy, Megan, as you alluded to, but if it were, hard to make a case against Sarukian. As far as what's next for Poirier, did openly, I guess, tease retirement or was open to questions about retirement in the buildup to UFC 302? But another one of Mahachev's former opponents has an idea of who the Diamond should fight next. Depending on uh, 
what I'm doing and when, you know, obviously I want to fight later in the year. I don't know exactly what's happening. I don't want to wait too long either. So if the timing works, maybe me and Dustin can, uh, you know, maybe have a good fight. I know he's like sort of, you know, just wants good, uh, fun fights. Obviously, we've got a lot of respect for each other and I think that'd be a massive fight. So that's something that I'll be willing to do uh, while I'm waiting for that uh, featherweight title. Maybe a lightweight fight against someone like a Dustin Poirier will be great. So you heard it here first. Maybe we can make something happen. Dustin, you're a legend. Um, keep your head up. That was a great performance still. And uh, maybe we could uh, have a little fun in there, have a little dance. While I'm waiting for that featherweight title, Brett, it doesn't sound like Volkanovski reading between the lines as a candidate to challenge Taporia at Perth in August, like some may have penciled in. In terms of the matchmaking that's out there for the former featherweight king, how sensible would a, a venture up to lightweight, I presume? I know, I know Poirier is a former featherweight, but I think this would happen at 155. How much sense does that make? Uh, and for Alex Vol Volkanovsky, a fight against anyone always makes sense, right? I mean, the guy just, he loves staying active. He loves getting in the octagon. I'm sure he's chomping at the bit just to get in there against somebody. And so he sees a guy like Dustin Poirier receiving his flowers the other night at 302. It's a fight that I think the fans would love. How much sense it makes? I, I don't know if it makes much sense, to be honest with you. And I think that that's the way the UFC would look at it. You know, Volkanovsky is still right there for a championship, as you mentioned, Phil. Uh, I don't think the UFC would want to, to buy into him moving up and wait for what he calls a fun fight when he's right there for championship status. You know that Dana White likes to keep things sort of in line. He wants guys to be chasing those championships. And quite frankly, I think that that's what Polkanovski should be doing. So I know he wants to get in there before the end of the year in terms of what makes sense for him. You know, they're gonna have to talk about that, but uh, I don't see this fight happening. But gosh, I love listening to uh, to Volk just calling out everybody because the guy is a madman. He just loves to fight. Megan, uh, something you and I have talked about, you know, I mean, we talk MMA a lot outside of this show. Is MMA math fair here to, to kind of, I guess, add to the the positive impression that Volk has, considering his first fight against Islam, the full camp fight, how competitive that was, and then seeing Mahachev get visibly the better of Poirier? Did, did, were you, I guess, uh, did, did your impression of Alex elevate seeing Mahachev continue to build his CV? Oh, 100 percent. And coming into this weekend, a lot of questions were kind of going to be answered because Islam hadn't actually defended a belt against a lightweight. That was the big kind of question on his legacy as the champion because he'd had those two fights with Alex. But then when you watch that fight between Dustin and Islam and how good Islam's striking was and how hard a time Dustin had being able to really execute his game plan, it just shows you how good Alex Volkanovsky really is and how much when he is given enough time to acclimate to the lightweight division, he is dangerous. He took the fight to Islam. He hurt him. He knocked him down a couple of times. He was willingly engaging in the wrestling and the grappling exchanges, which a lot of people don't want to do, which understandably so. Look at what Islam has been able to do to people when it does get to the ground. So the fact that Alex was able to have so much success where a lot of other guys who are naturally bigger lightweights weren't able to do as well. It just elevates the stature and how good a caliber of fighter that Alex Volkanovsky really is in the grand scheme of it, no matter what weight class, he's going to be able to find success. Brett, quick follow-up for you. Alex turns 36 in September. I mean, Father Time, he's a great athlete. Father Time is going to start to catch up with him if he hasn't already. If you were an advisor to Alex, would you suggest he stay at featherweight or, or I guess, continue to test the waters against other lightweight elite? I would tell him to stay at featherweight, uh, for sure. I mean, that has been his, his most natural weight class. You know, nobody likes to cut a whole lot of weight, but it always seemed like Alex did it professionally and didn't have too much of a hard time doing it. Uh, look, I think that one of Alex's problems was what I alluded to earlier is that he just likes to fight so frequently. I think that he got a little ahead of himself. I think he he, he bit off a little more than he could chew in some of those fights. Um, I like that he's taking some time off now. And, and again, I love the guy for calling out Dustin Poirier, but he's got big fights ahead of him. Those opportunities are coming. He doesn't have to try to, to push the envelope any more um, than just sit back and wait for those big opportunities to come. I know he's impatient, but they will come. And in the meantime, I think a little bit of time off for this guy's physical health, mental health was always a good thing. So if I was advising Alex Volkanovsky, I'd be like, bro, 
keep cooking steaks, run that uh, that cooking channel, enjoy your family, and when the and the big fight is coming, I promise you it's coming.